CBS 8's Jenny Day. I'll get you caught up on a week's worth of news and look ahead in just 30 minutes. Welcome to Around San Diego. We do begin in East County. An El Cajon woman is courageously sharing her story after falling for a so-called Geek Squad scam and losing $30,000. Sue DuPont says looking back, there were red flags and she hopes it won't happen to others. The widow reached out to CBS 8 for help on what to do now. CBS 8's Abby Black has her story. Sue DuPont uses Best Buy's Geek Squad, so when she got this email to renew her contract, she didn't think much of it, except it said for three users and she only needed one. So that's when she got on the phone with the number that was on the email. But that's when you say the nightmare started. Mm -hmm. In the last two years, 75 year old Sue DuPont lost her son and husband. So I'm just here. Now, the El Cajon widow lost $30,000 to scammers. She doesn't really like to talk about how it makes her feel to lose her nest egg. <laughs> but she bravely tells us how she fell for the Geek Squad email scheme. What they did was they got in there on my m machine computer. DuPont says she's not tech savvy and the real Geek Squad has accessed her computer remotely before, so she didn't question it when it came time to pay the scammers. I thought they were crediting me $300. She says the scammers moved the decimals around to make it look like she took 30000 from them. They said, now you owe us 30000 I said, well, take it out. I said, you put it in, take it out. I can't do that. That's when the nightmare began. DuPont says that multiple times she was denied wire transfers. This one was going to Cambodia. Looking back, she knows this had all the makings of a scam. <clears throat> I was telling people, you know, it's going to my sister because he told me not to tell him. Stupid, I know. Despite the red flags that CBS 8 continues to warn people about scams. Mm -hmm. I just noticed a typo here. DuPont says that she was pressured and caught up in the moment. Or he's going to lose his job. But DuPont says that she was able to withdraw $30,000 cash from her account at Bank of America and mail it via UPS. They told me to put the money in the books, wrap the books, put the books in the safe thing. A few days later. After three days of this. I kind of figured it out. 30 grand was gone, and so was her sense of security. Well, who knows what's real and what isn't? DuPont says that she reported the scam to the FBI Internet Crimes Complaint Center. They were not available for comment about this case, but we walked her through what the FBI recommends all scam victims do, including freezing accounts. Like, did you change your passwords? DuPont understands that she may never get her money back, but she hopes this warns others not to fall for scams. There's no way I can recoup the money without somebody going after him. In El Cajon, Abby Black, CBS 8. Yeah, I'm so glad she did share her story and please, my goodness, do not fall victim. Abby, thank you. Well, right now, Chula Vista police are looking for four people who robbed a FedEx truck driver in the East Lake neighborhood. That robbery happened on Thursday and was caught on ring camera. In the video, you can see a blue car pull up next to the FedEx truck. Four people in hoodies and masks get out and come at the driver with a weapon. They then go straight for the packages inside the truck. Chula Vista police say the group got away with about about five boxes. They are now asking anyone with more information to come forward. And there's been an arrest in a shooting that paralyzed a 17 year old girl. That girl is the niece of activist Shane Harris. The San Diego County District Attorney says 19 year old Juan Diaz Velasco was arrested and is charged with assault with a firearm and other gun charges. Investigators say on October 28th, gang members used gang challenges to rivals outside of a high school party. Diaz Velasco allegedly fired the first shots, which hit and paralyzed the teenage girl. Diaz Velasco has pleaded not guilty and is expected back in court on December 12th. Well, we are learning the three victims murdered in the shooting at the University of, of Nevada, Las Vegas, were faculty members. No students were shot. Authorities say the gunman identified as 67 year old Tony Polito was a former college professor and had been denied a job at UNLV. Authorities say he died in a shootout with two university detectives. They say he had a list with him of people he was targeting. If it hadn't been for the her heroic actions of one of those police officers who responded, there could have been countless additional lives taken.
Yeah, fourth victim, also a faculty member, continues to recover in the hospital. According to the Gun Violence Archive, there have been more than 630 mass shootings in America just this year. We are learning more now about the man accused of threatening to carry out a mass shooting at a Poway Unified Elementary School in Carmel Mountain Ranch. 38 year old Lee Lore is accused of sending an email and threatening to shoot up Shoal Creek Elementary last Friday. Those who know him tell us that he's ex military and from court paperwork. We learned that Lore targeted Shoal Creek because it's quote where the neighbor kids go to school. We spoke with some parents who shared their concerns, of course, about the incident. This is my first child in school. This is the scariest thing that I could ever, that I could ever go through. And there were a lot of parents that weren't sure about sending their kids in today. Yeah, so Tuesday, a judge granted a gun violence restraining order, which prevents law from possessing or purchasing any weapons. Right now, he is being charged with one count of making criminal threats and is being held without bail. Well, now to a Scripps ranch man and other community members who have compiled a list of more than six dozen street lights that need to be repaired across San Diego. CBS 8's Ariana Cohen is working for you. She went to several locations where street lights are out and reached out to the city to see when they will be fixed. Yes, people living in Scripps Ranch say these lights here at Scripps Ranch Community Park have been out for two years. They also told me about 75 other street lights that the city still needs to fix. It's mind boggling. Bob Ilko is the president of the Scripps Ranch Civic Association. He's filed reports on the city's Get It Done app to get street lights repaired with no luck. So he reached out to us. It's a system wide failure by the city to maintain and repair repair and replace uh, street lights. Uh, right now the wait list to get a light replaced or repaired is about 365 days. A few months ago the backlog was 6,000. I believe it's down to about 4,000 street lights that need to be re replaced. He and other community members came up with this list of 75 street lights across San Diego that have gone out and need to be fixed, including these street lights on Scripps Ranch Boulevard and Opelousa, and here on Avery and Canyon Lake Drive, one has broken glass. It's citywide. Uh, it's a crime issue. We would love to for the, the city to hire more outside contractors as well as using in-house staff and to, to complete these light uh, repairs. Others I spoke to in the area say the lights at Scripps Ranch Community Park have been out for years. At least two years, there's never been lights, and it's a little, you know, unnerving. You need light at a park with children playing. They definitely need to replace the lights as soon as possible. And it's not just at this park. There are many streets in Scripps Ranch that do not have street lights. I reached out to the city. They told CBS 8, quote, according to the Transportation Department, city electrical crews will be in Scripps Ranch in the next 60 days to evaluate unilluminated street lights for repair. This comes as the city has just begun rolling out the $2.3 million in electrical contracting budgeted for this year to make more progress towards reducing the backlog across the city. We, we all uh, want our communities to be the best they, they can, and it, that's the city's job to get that done. CBS 8 is excellent, and they're here for us and here for the city. Working for you, Ariana Cohen, CBS 8. Yeah, glad to hear that. We are sure trying. Well, water rates are going up for 200,000 people in National City, Bonita, and parts of Chula Vista. The Sweetwater Authority just approved a series of rate increases totaling 13% over the next three years. Residents spoke out ahead of that vote. I'm not here to ask you. I'm here to demand that you do not allow this. You do not allow this. Yeah, rates will initially increase a half percent on January 1st, then another 6% the following year, and then another 6.5% in 2026. Officials say the rates remain among the lowest in the, in the county. 
Well, the San Diego City Council voted five to four to reelect Sean Elo Rivera to a third term as council president. That same day, President Pro Tem Monica Montgomery Stepp moved on to her seat as a county supervisor. This means the city council has just eight members for at least the next few months, which could lead to some deadlocked votes. You can read more about that vote on our website, cbs8.com. Well, the enactment of a state law that expands the state's conservatorship laws and involuntary hospitalizations to those with severe substance abuse disorders has been delayed now by one year. The delay of Senate Bill 43 was approved by the County Board of Supervisors 3-2 to two on Tuesday. Chairwoman Nora Vargas brought forward the resolution paving the way for what she calls a thoughtful, inclusive approach to implementing the law. The CEO of Scripps Health also shared a statement saying they support the delay and that creating new involuntary holds in hospitals for severe substance abuse patients without any proper education and training is irresponsible. Vargas says the goal is to execute SB 43 appropriately by January 1st of 2025. And the shortage of behavioral health beds has been declared a crisis unanimously by the San Diego City Council. By declaring this a crisis, council members believe it will free up city employees to work on how to address the shortage of beds when state funding does become available. According to Councilman Raul Campillo, San Diego needs to increase the number of beds by 450. This all comes as Governor Gavin Newsom is pushing voters to approve Proposition 1, which would would create more than 11,000 behavioral health beds and more than 26,000 outpatient treatment slots. It will be on ballots in March of next year. Well, did you hear this one? The Port of San Diego voted to sign a term sheet with Top Golf. This brings the proposed venue along the waterfront on East Harbor Island one step closer to happening. The vote means a lease agreement can be drafted for consideration by the board sometime next year. The estimated cost of the project, $61 million. There is opposition from some members of the community who say that land shouldn't be used that way. You can read more about the proposed Top Golf on our website, CBS 8. Dot com. Well, parking meters could be coming to two more neighborhoods soon. San Diego City Council approved a proposal to create community parking districts in San Ysidro and the convoy area in Kearney Mesa. That opens the door for council to add meters there, which city planners hope will help with parking. San Ysidro and convoy are the sixth and seventh parking districts in the city. Downtown, Mid City, Uptown, Pacific Beach and Old Town are the others. Well, a staging area is set up in East County for migrants seeking asylum in the U.S. This comes after Border Patrol agents reported an increase in people slipping through holes in that border wall. At the staging area in Hakumba Hot Springs, migrants wait for buses to take them to processing centers once room becomes available, but many are waiting there for days. A volunteer handing out food tells CBS 8 he started seeing larger crowds around 10 weeks ago. Since then, he says they've fed at least 13 13,000 people. The weather gets down to below 30 degrees and you know 35 degrees during the day and the 20s at night. Some people are going to die in these camps. I'm sorry to say that but it's just going to happen. Yeah, we have learned of several other staging areas, some in East County and some closer to San Ysidro as well. And a former San Diego County Sheriff's Department sergeant was in court this week after pleading guilty to arranging a meeting for sex with a decoy pretending to be a 15 year old boy. As CBS 8's David Godfordson reports, the 56 year old defendant was supposed to be sentenced, but that all changed at the last minute. Former San Diego Sheriff Sergeant Luis Rios walked out of downtown court Tuesday, still uncertain what his sentence will be. In October, he pleaded guilty to a felony, meeting up with a decoy who he thought was a 15-year-old boy. The charge stemmed from an undercover sting operation set up by an online vigilante group. The group's founder posed as a teenager online and lured Rios to a parking lot in Mission Valley to meet up for sex. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Ramona McCarthy for the people. In court Tuesday, Rios was facing up to a year in jail at his sentencing, 
but his attorney asked for a continuance because Rios has moved to Nevada and wants to serve his sentence there. Deputy District Attorney Ramona McCarthy spoke afterwards. He wanted to see whether or not he could contact probation up in Nevada and see what terms and conditions should the defendant remain in Nevada be if he was sentenced on this case. Are you moving to Nevada? I live in Nevada, sir. An arrest warrant in the case alleges Rios, who used to work at the downtown jail, engaged in sexually explicit text messages with the undercover decoy in 2021 and 2022. The subsequent meeting and confrontation were live streamed on YouTube, leading to Rios' arrest in April. Rios is no longer with the Sheriff's Department. It will now be up to a San Diego judge whether he gets jail time or probation. If the court moves forward and grants the defendant probation, that probation, like any case, could come with a certain amount of custody time or certain amount of conditions and restrictions. Do you have anything to say about this vigilante group that targeted you? Nope. As part of his plea deal, Rios will be required to register as a sex offender. Rios will remain out of custody on bail through the holidays now. His next court appearance is January 9th. At the downtown courthouse, David Goffertson, CBS 8. David, thank you. Well, the U.S. military says it's grounding all of its Osprey aircraft. This comes one week after eight Air Force Special Operations Service members died in an Osprey crash off the coast of Japan. A preliminary investigation found something went wrong with the aircraft, and the crash was not a result of human error. The Osprey has come under scrutiny several times in the past over multiple deadly accidents in a relatively short time in service. Well, Carlsbad city leaders are now looking into ways to cut back on plane noise that residents say threatens their health and their safety. The city council voted to move forward on plans, including sending letters to those pilots who disregard voluntary recommendations already in place, such as the flight curfew from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m., as well as the recommended flight paths for pilots taking off and landing at the airport. We're all between a rock and a hard spot, so I appreciate anything the city council is willing to do on this one. Um, don't know if it's going to work or not, but give it a try. Certainly keep you posted. So Carlsbad city leaders say they plan to revisit this issue and hopefully take action on it in the next two months. Well, ceremonies around the nation commemorated the deadly bombing of Pearl Harbor 82 years ago on Thursday. In Washington, D.C., a 21 bell salute for the fallen was held at the National World War II Memorial. The attack killed more than 2,300 service members, launching the U.S. into World War II. Here in San Diego, the USS Midway Museum held its annual two bell ceremony, honoring every service member who was killed during the Pearl Harbor attack. One specific story that was shared during the ceremony was of mess cook Doris Miller, who risked his life and helped bring wounded sailors to safety. He was the first black American to receive the Navy Cross for heroism. And the family of another Pearl Harbor survivor told us these stories are important, and it is sad that only a handful of survivors are still with us to share those stories. There are stories that nobody's ever going to get to hear again because they're not here to tell it. And they're stories that you don't read in books or you see in silly movies. They're real stories of how they survived, you know, and that's what is sad to me is that those stories are, are largely lost. Yeah, we got to listen now. He is so, so right. So the USS Midway Museum also had its wreath laying ceremony and the missing man flyover, both annual traditions for December 7th. Well, a first of its kind recycling plant in Las Vegas will ensure the plastic you're recycling is used once again. The Polymer Recycling Center is run by Republic Services and San Diego's plastics will be feeding into it. They shared this video with us. Unlike other plants that often downcycle plastics into materials that have few options for additional recycling, the Polymer Center will separate plastic by color specific bales and deliver it to the manufacturers who will use it to make new packaging in a more efficient and reusable way. 
we hear some, we do hear from customers. There's some confusion. There's some frustration. Um, you know, what's recyclable, what isn't recyclable. The unique thing about Polymer Center is we can we can create transparency and traceability of that material from the curbside all the way back into that manufacturing process and ultimately, um, you know, a package back on the shelf. Yeah, sincerely appreciate what they're doing. So all you have to do is make sure that you are putting your recyclables and plastics into your Republic Services bin. You can read more about the process online at CBS8.com. Well, students at High Tech High Media Arts are getting hands-on experience with UC San Diego research students that could help in medical breakthroughs. In this Innovate 8, CBS State's Abby Black shares the impact this is making on future scientists. Researchers with UC San Diego's outreach program are teaching students at High Tech High about gene editing, but it's more than just a lesson in chemistry. It's lighting the way for their future in science. Okay, so what do we see in terms of colonies? From the naked eye, this petri dish looks like it's filled with little bubbles, but with a closer look under a UV light, it expresses a green fluorescent protein. Green head, but it looks like you got the perfect results. You've got green guys in the targeting one. You high tech, high media art students use this experiment to learn about base editing, where they were tasked to cure the bacteria. This is a concept that paves the way for genome editing research, such as climate resilient crops or treating human disease at the genetic level. So even though it's not medicinal based or therapeutic based, it's still the same concepts that we apply um, to future health related issues. Carlos Vasquez is a PhD student at UC San Diego researching genome editing. I love the uh, concept where we could help all kinds of people, every single person down the road. He's also helping to lead the genome editing technologies program that does outreach with local high schools. This education partnership also exposes students to scientists with diverse backgrounds. For me, it's like really cool to like see the people who are doing it. Vasquez says having a mentor helped carve his path to becoming a scientist, and he wants to be that for the younger generation. Yeah, it's really important to get out to into our community and start talking to high school students about genome editing because they're the they're the future. This is an important field. There's a lot of ethical questions and concerns moving forward. This not only makes base editing accessible to high schools, but students like Mateo Espino say this has expanded his critical thinking skills. It's about like how we can edit before like the babies are even born and then also like enhancing certain genes. Um, also how they're like working on creating new um, gene editors and then learn also about a lot of like the ethical factors of that. This experiment has sparked a conversation that may help these students see a future in being a part of medical, therapeutic or agricultural breakthroughs. Right now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to expand like my range of opportunities and my range of interests. So this has definitely helped me with that. At High Tech High Media Arts for Innovate 8, Abby Black, CBS 8. Ugh, thankful for their brilliant minds. Abby, thanks. Well, the holidays are a really fun time, of course, for humans and for animals, too. But there are a lot of dangers around this time of year that could be harmful to your pet. CBS 8's Brian White explains what pet owners should be aware of. Now to help me go over some pet safety tips from the San Diego Humane Society, I've got my little helper here, Mr. Cliffy. Me and him go way back and he loves the holidays. Number one, Christmas trees can be dangerous, especially for a climbing cat. Make sure yours is secure and won't fall over. Another concern, glass ornaments that can break if knocked off the tree. Mine here are plastic and shatterproof, so I don't have to worry about that. Number two, wrapped presents. If you're wrapping gifts, especially those containing food or chocolate, keep them out of your pet's reach. If Cliffy here can smell it, he'll definitely get into it. Number three, holiday foods. If you're baking some cookies or making some treats, be aware of what's left unattended on the table. Cliffy's not shy about hopping up there and he can end up eating too much of something that's not good for him. Number four, toxic plants. Holly, ivy, juniper, and others can be dangerous for your pet. It's important to keep them out of reach. Number five, unsafe pet toys. Make sure they don't have parts that can break off like buttons or ribbons that can be a choking hazard. Number six, snow globes. They can actually be dangerous if they break open. The liquid ethylene glycol is toxic for pets. It's important to keep them out of reach. Number seven, lit candles can be a problem around a wagging tail. Those two should be kept up high and out of reach. Number eight, if you have visitors, your pets may get into their suitcase. 
Any pill bottles or medications need to be locked away. Number nine, any homemade Play-Doh or salt dough ornaments can be a tempting treat for your pets, but can also cause harm if ingested. And number 10, open doors. With people coming and going, Cliffy's been known to slip out a time or two, so microchipping and a collar with info on it are very important. And finally, they say your little one can get stressed, so it's important they have a quiet place they can retreat to and be comfortable. For me and Cliffy, happy holidays. I'm Brian White for CBS 8. Can't expand mm -hmm. Good soul. stuff, Brian. Thank you. Uh, well, yes, it's true. Juan Soto is no longer a San Diego Padre. The team announced they have traded their all-world slugger to the New York Yankees for four pitchers. Soto came to San Diego a season and a half ago and helped get the Padres to the NL NLCS that year. This past season, Soto played in all 162 games and led the Padres with 35 home runs, 109 RBIs, and 132 walks. The deal does also include San Diego center fielder Trent Grisham. Well, we, of course, are working for you to figure out how much more expensive those holiday light displays are with sky high electricity rates. People we talked with in one Claremont neighborhood tell us they typically pay a couple hundred dollars more this time of year compared to their typical bill. One factor for the higher cost lights are typically on during SDG and E's peak usage hours between 4 and 9 p.m. If you are using old incandescent lights, those need eight to 10 times more power compared to LED. You know, a lot of people get their old Christmas lights out year after year, but this is the year to get them out and throw them out. And the reason being is that uh, investing in LED will help you cut the expense of the lighting down. Yeah, neighbors we um, met with in this Claremont neighborhood agree and say that LEDs are the way to go. Well, holiday shopping is also in full swing. CBS 8's Ariana Cohen is working for you. She talked to a financial expert to learn some simple and easy steps to avoid holiday debt this season. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, San Diego households spent an average of $86,299 per year in 2021 and 2022, which is higher than anywhere in the U.S. The study shows San Diegans are spending most of their money on housing, transportation, and food. And now that holiday shopping season is here, financial experts are warning against falling into the debt trap. I spoke with New York York financial attorney Leslie Tane, who has practiced debt relief for more than 20 years. 80% of the population who are going to be spending this holiday season are going to be using credit cards. The reason that most consumers use credit cards not only is for credit card protection, but also because they simply don't have the cash to use and spend. Most consumers are supplementing their income with credit cards because they simply don't have enough money to meet their obligations. She broke down how to avoid holiday debt into a few simple and easy steps. First, create a budget. Second, make a list of what you have to buy and stick to that list. Thirdly, treat your personal finances as if you are running a small business. It is a business. Personal finances are really a, it's your household and your personal finances are really a business. Money comes in and money has to go out. And managing that, if you think about it in a business mindset, will give you a different perspective. You can step back from the emotional purchases, especially when you're looking at wants versus needs. Shoppers still plan to spend on average more than $1,600 this holiday season. That's 14% more than last year. Tane recommends to be realistic about what you can afford, have money conversations with family, and make a credit card payment plan. Working for you, Ariana Cohen, CBS 8. Really so important and helpful. Ariana, thank you. Well, kids at the Boys and Girls Club and Canto Branch walked into a winter wonderland of surprises that included a $25,000 makeover to their club. It was all thanks to a grant from Cox Communications. The makeover includes brand new technology like TVs and computers, as well as new sports e gaming area. And this is, um, isn't the only thing that these kids were given either. And they're each going to get a huge bag of Christmas wish list items that they requested for the holidays. And that's donated by our Cox employees. 
Oh, my heart. This is so sweet. So the kids were also treated to a visit from Santa Claus and got to sit down and relax while watching a Christmas movie. Well, more than one in four people will spend the holidays without family. That's according to the AARP. This time of year, many seniors will isolate themselves, but it doesn't have to be that way, and you can help bring them holiday cheer. CBS 8's Abby Black shares a special delivery. Senior helpers visits 71 year old Robin DeWing weekly, but he had no idea that Santa was on his way. Santa's elves are getting a head start on the holidays. Happy holidays! Oh, look at you! It's the Christmas tree that really lights up Robin DeWing's face. <laughs> I'm Robin Tree. Robin eagerly finds just the right spot to admire his own tree. This feels like the royal treatment. It can be lonely at times for the Army veteran. He lives on his own in a grainy flat in Lemon Grove, but still finds solitude. I'm not about to quit. His outlook is inspiring senior helpers, a non-medical care provider who visit the elderly year-round, but during the holidays, they spread extra cheer. We just wanted to bring you some holiday happiness this morning because we think you're amazing. Santa's helpers decorate Robin's tree. There you go. Ta -da. As they hang the ornament, you can hear Robin sharing many stories. He has a way with words. You gotta dig deep and find the stuff to keep going. The veteran is also a poet. I been held by a string. But then he pauses. I'm a lyricist and I'm out of, out of I'm almost lost for words. The words he could find to say. And I don't know how to say thank you except thank you. These words are a gift of gratitude. It's a gift given to people that can't give back. That's what Christmas is to me. He's carried a positive tune his whole life. But right now, my singing voice is taking a holiday. Boy, oh boy. But Robin's spirit is carrying the right note. I we, think you're awesome. Don't, don't cry. We don't have... I, I this don't have is the real gift of giving. Hey, I feel like you gave us more Christmas spirit than you gave, we gave you well, this I don't morning, know so I don't really happening. know what to say. Santa's helpers hope to continue to deliver the gift of joy, hope, and compassion. And hopefully our story gives everyone the inspiration to check in on our seniors. Whether it be wrapping gifts with your senior neighbor, taking them shopping, or spending the afternoon baking cookies, or making ornaments can make a big impact with a senior. You just keep going. You gotta keep making footprints. In Lemon Grove. I will thank you for coming to my house. Abby Black, CBS 8. That's really what it is all about. Let's keep spreading that kindness. As always, thank you for your time. Thank you for staying informed. For CBS 8, I'm Jenny Day. Take such good care.